Good morning, our viewers. My name is Alena Yeware. I'm the Chief Manager Corporate Affairs and Communication at Centenary Bank. And today, Centenary Bank is doing one of the things it does best. That is one of our philanthropy activities, which is bridging the cancer gap. Remember, we're in the Breast Cancer Month, and we ought to do something about breast cancer, building awareness, helping um, people who are ill on how to survive, caretakers on what to do, families on how to adapt. So we've been on this journey for 10 years right now. And today, it's still one of the things we're going to do is to talk to our viewers. So you're welcome. Thank you for joining us. And right here with me is uh, Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis is um, an oncologist here at Nsambi Hospital. She will introduce herself further. She's here to share with us. And um, to my right is uh, Miss Gertrude, Gertrude Nachigude. She is a cancer survivor, and she's also a chairperson of Uganda Women Cancer Survivors Association. She will talk more about it. So get ready. There's so much knowledge here today. <laughs> Thank you. So I think let me first start with Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis, we are happy to see you. We are happy to be with you today. Thank you, Alan. And for sparing time to come and also give back, <laughs> telling us about cancer. Yes. Yeah. You can see we all have our pink ribbons. Um, if you don't have one to celebrate uh, Breast Cancer Month, Please get one. <laughs> so, Dr. Lewis, um, you will introduce yourself, but then tell us about the extent um, of breast cancer in the country. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, Dr. Lois Asimwe, I'm a surgical oncologist at St. Francis uh, Hospital in Zambia Cancer Center. So that simply means I'm a surgeon who specializes in cancer management, okay? Um, Cancer, breast cancer, it's, it's, it's really great to have this opportunity to talk about breast cancer uh, in October, uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, because uh, breast cancer is a big problem in Uganda. Um, after cervical cancer, it is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women, and we have great challenges when it comes to its management, as we will share. So this, it's really a good opportunity to talk about it. At our center in Nsambia, it is, breast cancer is the most common uh, diagnosis that we have. So most of the women who we treat um, have breast cancer. And um, unlike what you may think, we are noticing that younger ladies also are getting breast cancer. So up to 40% of our patients are under 40 which is quite young, yes. And uh, we also never talk about the 1% of breast cancer patients who are male patients. So that's what the cancer, breast cancer picture in Uganda is like. Okay. 40% <laughs> under 40. So, you know, what are the signs, what are the symptoms? Uh, someone below 40, what should they look out for? even above 40, but now that you've raised that below 40, <laughs> is there anything different? So the first thing that uh, is important to understand is that in the early stages, breast cancer may not even have any symptoms, okay? Um, but one of the most common uh, presentations that we get is uh, a breast lump. So a lump is just a swelling in the breast, and this lump may start off small and slowly increase in size. Uh, it may be painless most of the time. In a few patients, it may be painful, but mostly painless. And as this lump grows, it, it may, um, the lady may become more aware of it. It may become stuck to the skin. And when it grows through the skin, that's when it will form a wound, a wound on the skin. Sometimes you may have changes on the skin that's just unusual. The skin uh, may look a bit swollen. It may start to look um, discolored. It may start to look like the peel of an orange. 
That's how we describe it medically. But all these skin changes, a lump, may, should make someone suspicious about breast cancer. Um, the other way that it presents sometimes is with a discharge from the nipple. So this discharge may be blood stained. And um, so these symptoms, these signs and symptoms kind of give us, um, may give someone a clue. But in the very earliest stages, it may not have any symptoms. Yes. Okay, what I'm picking is any abnormality, whether on the skin or the nipple or a swelling, just go for a checkup immediately. Yeah. Wow. Are there any risk factors? I mean, we hear people talk about uh, junk food. <laughs> you know, just, just speak to that. What, what could be the common risk factors? So when it comes to breast cancer, there are uh, some risk factors that you're born with uh, that are related to your genetic makeup, and there are some that you may be exposed to. So genetics, it, it's really about your genes, what you inherit from your parents. There are certain genes that put someone at extra risk of uh, developing breast and other types of cancers. So that's one of the risk factors. And then the things we are exposed to, which may be in form of hormones, um, it may be uh, certain types of contraceptives, it may be certain types of medication that ladies may be taking, hormone uh, replacements that they may be taking as they approach menopause that put them at risk. Um, there are certain inbuilt factors, like um, having uh, starting your periods really early in life and uh, having menopause much later in life, those put you at a risk. Um, when you look at some factors like how many children you have, the fewer children you have, the more you are at risk of breast cancer. <laughs> or if you have no children at all, if you've not breastfed, so breastfeeding is protective against breast cancer. So some of, some of those are the risks. And then there are also the others that you probably heard about, smoking, alcohol use, um, being obes obesity, um, you know, some of these other um, more commonly talked about risk factors. Yes. So I would say there are a number of risk factors. But even if you don't have any of these risk factors, you can still get breast cancer. And even when you have these risk factors, it doesn't mean you're going to get can breast cancer. It just means that you have that added risk. Yes. It was an important one, you know, that even if you don't have these risk factors, still go for a checkup. And even if you have them, you shouldn't live a worried life, you know. Um, I'm thinking, so how often should we do these checkups? You know, probably you had a lamp. You went, they checked it. Some of them are removed and checked. And let me say at that time, there is no cancer. But how often should maybe a 30-year-old, a 60-year-old, and should we come annually? Should we every other month? <laughs> so just like I said that, that uh, people have different risk factors. We are all different. Um, the schedules are personalized. So my schedule for checkup is not the same as yours. So what happens is, that's why we encourage every lady to see your doctor today. So when you see your doctor, they will take you through, they will get your history and get uh, your risk factors. And then they'll categorize you as either low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. And based on your specific risk factors, they will come up with a schedule for you for checkup. While a high risk patient may be checked maybe every six months, a moderate risk maybe once a year, a low risk patient may have screening every two years. So it's really, it should be personalized. There's no broad um, uh, category uh, that I would say. The best is when it is personalized to you. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> so our viewers, um, with all that we hear about cancer, there are some positive stories. And right here is um, Miss Gertrude Nachigudere already spoke her name. 
but she will introduce herself uh, further. She is a breast cancer survivor, 19 years in Uganda, you know. <laughs> so, Gertrude, tell us more. Good afternoon, viewers. My name is Gertrude Nachigude. I'm a breast cancer survivor for 19 years. And I head an organization of women who have survived or living with cancer, Uganda Women's Cancer Support Organization. Um, I survived the cancer 19 years ago. As the uh, doctor mentioned, that one of the signs that women should look out for is a painless lamp. I felt a small, a stone like something in my breast just accidentally. But then nobody was talking about breast cancer. So I didn't bother about it. And I could touch it, feel it, and leave it but share with my friends that I have a small stone in my breast and they would make fun of it. And they, because it wasn't painful, I had it for a year. And they, when I had it removed, it was breast cancer. So the news shook, uh, shocked me because this is the least I expected. You know, when they talk about cancer, it's like a, a death sentence. Even me, I knew I wouldn't even survive beyond the hospital when they gave me the results. And uh, that's how my journey started, with a lot of fear of death, uh, with the uh, imaginations of pain, because what I'd heard before was when you have cancer, you die in pain, mm -hmm. you die rotting and smelling. So those are the imaginations I had. So, um, but I'm happy to be here today that I'm able to share a story. Um, of course, the news is shocking. Uh, when the surgeon uh, gave me the results, he thought it was, I would take it easily because we were like, as we were seated here, he said, you know, my sister, that thing we removed had cancer in it. And I fell off the chair because I couldn't imagine. Mm. But, uh, I, I mean, the nurses are the ones who helped me to call my, my work, my employer, and uh, then my family. But uh, it took me about two weeks to come to terms. Um, every time I would talk to a, a surgeon, a doctor, they were talking about terms that I wouldn't even comprehend. Mm -hmm. we are, when, because when I asked the, the doctor, what are we going to do? He said, mastectomy. I was like, now what is that? He said, removing the breast. Oh my goodness. Now I couldn't imagine as a young lady to have no breast. And uh, when, I said, when he said removing the breast, I said, where? He said, here. So I had never seen anyone who had no breasts. You know, in the, in the our community, they would say women with no, com with no breasts are witch or caste. Mm -hmm. So taking it to the cultural and the societal beliefs. So I went in for a uh, mastectomy without seeing anyone who had gone through that. I didn't know what to expect. And my expectation was to have an open wound have something open. And when I shared with my family, my mother was like, what are we going to use to cover that part? Mm. And the heart will be always popping out and then what are we going to do? So I, even today, I see women and the first question is, what am I going to use to cover that mm. opening? Mm. But to my surprise, after my surgery, when they opened the plasters, I saw a line. I said, no, the surgeon didn't tell me this. And actually that gave, gave me relief because my expectation was an open wound with the, with, with the pass. Mm -hmm. But I saw a nicely done surgery, and it was done here with a surgeon from Lago. So that gave me hope to fight on. And when I finished surgery, I was told I'm going to do chemotherapy. That was another new term. And uh, I didn't know what to expect. I thought it was an injection, go like you have a malaria injection. And of course, I was subject to many tests throughout to like a two weeks, do the heart, do this, but with no explanations. 
And the, the day I went for chemotherapy, I went alone mm -hmm. because I expected a, a simple injection and then go home. So after chemotherapy, the story was different. I was dizzy. Uh, it was too much. Mm -hmm. So my story was full of surprises. Mm -hmm. to every stage was a surprise. And uh, to my surprise, because when I asked my surgeon, how long am I going to survive? He said, mm, you have the aggressive type of breast cancer. Normally, they don't survive more than five years. So it was also another shock. Everybody was shocked. Mm -hmm. But to my surprise, things were unfolding and they were getting better. Mm -hmm. I had my chemotherapy in Mulago. Then radiotherapy equipment was off for almost a year, so I missed radiotherapy. But I was subjected to hormonal therapy for five years. Mm -hmm. I also didn't know what to expect. But of course, there are a lot of challenges along the way. And uh, along the way, So, <laughs> and I remember my, before I started chemotherapy, one of my doctors saw, uh, told me that one of the side effects of this drug is infertility. So I knew, now I'm childless. But now, two years later, I was pregnant. And when I went for my antenatal, I met another doctor who is not an oncologist. And I was like, are you not making a mistake? I almost had a miscarriage. But the baby came out very alive. He, I thought he would have a Down syndrome. He was fine. And even right now, he's fine. He's 16 years. Oh, wow. So as survivors who went through that journey, we mobilized ourselves mm -hmm. to demystify some of this, that cancer is a death sentence. Mm -hmm. it, despite that I had a lump for a year, I really survived. So it's really important that when such signs present one can be treated and they survive mm. so Gertrude thank you very much your story is encouraging your story is typical you know just walk <laughs> to a doctor you get no explanation you don't ask about it it's, it's very typical of us but if I may ask what kept you going you know as you said your first experience was to fall off a chair so someone may think your story went, just continued that way. With every shocker, you would probably now stop at the gate of the hospital, not get in, or tell your mom if you're not coming with me, you know, because telling you only have five years and you've gone two or so, someone could lose hope and say, after all, I'm in pain. So what kept you going? I think the support from my family my family stood with me and my employer. I had just got a job with an international company. And when my boss knew, he said, we should do whatever we can to make sure you get the best care. So that gave me hope. Mm -hmm. Because when my surgeon mentioned that your, the, the, the small thing, the lamp had cancer, my instinct was where is going to the money coming from? Mm -hmm. My family is a humble family, and uh, I'm the third born in the family. So, you know, we are, you are all young and you're starting to work. So the first instinct was, where is the money coming from? And the surgeon made it worse because he said, your cancer is aggressive and you're young. You'll be better treated in outside Uganda, maybe South Africa. So all those hit me hard. But uh, my employer was, we shall do whatever we can. And now I encourage employers not to dis discriminate or let cancer patients as if they have no contribution. I've survived and I've made a big contribution. But also my family, my brothers, my sisters, and friends. All my friends who had the news were there for me. So that kept me going. They really support. And I felt the psychosocial support is very key in treating cancer. Thank you very much. You've talked about um, family. Maybe I can ask Dr. Lewis. So how should families cope, you know, at the news that your sister has been diagnosed with breast cancer? Um, what's the message? What, what, what sh you know, you may also fall off the chair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So one of the biggest challenges 
challenges that we have uh, in management of uh, breast cancer and other cancers is the social perception that, uh, you know, once they tell you you have cancer, that's it, that's the end. And it's something that we're slowly trying to, a myth that we're trying to dispel and to encourage people that there is hope. There is hope for survival. And um, usually when we meet a patient and we meet their family, we, we also talk to their family. We offer counseling for both the patient, for the family members, for the caretakers, because we know that um, without your encouragement, it's hard for the patient to make it. So ask questions, research about it, talk to your doctor, uh, for the family, talk to your doctor. Let them give you um, some encouragement. Let them show you what the picture is. But uh, the support of family is so, so important to keep the patient going. When you give up, then the patient also gives up. Yes. I know that still families go through their own challenges. And you know, well, you may be scared and you can't tell the patient that you're scared. And that's why we have a psychologist, that's why we have counselors, so that you can come and tell the psychologist, I am scared. And then you, they strengthen you so that you go back home and support um, the family. And actually, we've start, we are starting something where December is our caregivers month. We want to celebrate the caregivers. We want to support the caregivers because they are very important in the journey of the patient. Yeah, so. That is good. And um, I think we should be part of this caregivers month. Um, because they are, they are quite a number, and some learn on the job um, clearly, and yet it's pretty delicate uh, what they are handling. Um, if I may turn again to <laughs> Ms. Gertrude, tell us more about your organization. Um, you've told us, together with some survivors, you started an organization. So what help is there, or what does it do, generally, um, someone out there could need to know. Uh, thank you very much, Alan, for that question. Our organization is Uganda Women's Cancer Support Organization, where I'm the chief executive officer. And it was started 15 years ago after my treatment and the other five women. Depending on uh, we, what we went through, the information that we lacked, some of us even went astray and left treatment. So we started an organization to help patients, first of all, understand their diagnosis, but also give them hope that actually you can survive. And also help the caregivers and give them information. Because when they give results to a patient, the caregiver has more questions than even the patient. Because as a patient, you tend even to, not to forget to, to, to think maybe it wasn't correct, but the caregiver has more questions. So we do counseling to the caregiver, we prepare them. Because I, from my personal experience, I realized I didn't have much. I was, I was earning about 300,000, but my family would sit and raise money. So we realized they are worried about the costs. So counseling a, a caregiver help them make a, a good decision on their resources. So as an organization, as whereas we counsel the patients, but also we talk to caregivers. Also, we help women. The challenges I had, for example, what will I use when they cut off the breast? Mm. See the big challenge. So we mobilize breasts, artificial breasts, to make sure that a woman can sit like me here, and you think I have a, a breast, but actually I have an artificial breast. And these breasts are not anywhere on market. And even if, if, even if they are there in Europe or in, in the United States, they're very expensive. A breast goes for 200 to $300 when it's at the factory cost. But because we have had international partners, we, the survivors in Australia are dedicated to sending us these artificial breasts. But we pay for the cost of bringing them in. So we help women receive these breasts at a minimal cost because that is a big challenge. Some women will refuse even the treatment, will refuse mastectomy, she may testify because she doesn't know what will happen. But also, we advocate 
we 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 really engage i sit on the board of directors of uganda cancer institute mm. to bring out to the patient voice the needs because as clinicians, when they sit alone, they only talk about research, the disease, they forget about the person they are treating. Mm. So I really go to the table and say, no, the patient, before you even tr think about cancer, think about the person who has that disease, the families. Because they're the ones who make decisions and then decide either to come to Zambia or to UCI or to, or to, or to a herbalist. Mm. So unless the, the patient understands that, they will not receive the care even if you give it free. We do a lot of advocacy, but we also do education and information. We, we are create awareness, at least the, the, to, dismiss, to, to dispel the myth of cancer is a death sentence. Mm -hmm. So we go to institutions, to banks, I'm happy for this opportunity, that cancer when it's treated early, uh, you can survive mm -hmm. and it's treatable. So we do a lot of awareness at the opportune time we get. And also we do patient navigation. You know, we only have treatment in Kampala. Mm -hmm. Patients move from wherever they come from and they are lost. Mm -hmm. When you come to Kampala for the first time and you come we're already with the distresses of your family, of, of the poverty, and then you are in Kampala, you don't even know what to ask, you don't know the language. So our organization help patients navigate the complex system. You know you are in Mulaga and they say go to Zambia and they get a scan. Somebody doesn't know where you're in Zambia. And there are a lot of opportunists between here and the Mulago. They will take you somewhere and they will believe. Then they, many patients have been robbed. I call it robbed. You come all the little money you have, they're picked from the gate and they are taken. Before you realize you spent all the money, but you spent it to a wrong person. So we have a network of survivors. We are about 200 survivors across the country. And we work through our so survivors in the community, tell us this patient is coming, she needs information, that's what we do. And they come to our center for counseling, for information, so by the time they're going to treatment, they are, they at least they have the information that they need to make an informed decision, yes. Thank you, Gertrude. Thank you, uh, our viewers. I think you've heard. We should support that organization. They do lots of things and they need as much help as possible. So you could link to us at a Centenary Bank and we link you to Gertrude, but I, you may want to leave your number. Not now, but when, when we're concluding. <laughs> yes. Um, doctor, you told us about uh, the risk factors, so any sort of prevention? So when it comes to prevention, just like I shared the risk factors, there are things you can do something about and there are things you can't do anything about, okay? So you can't change your genes. The genes you got are the genes you got, okay? <laughs> There are some things that may not be easy for you to modify, like the number of children you have, okay? If you are a nun and you've taken a vow, okay, to, to, to not have children, then you can't change that, okay? You may not have, you may have one or two because maybe that's what you could afford or you had some fertility challenges. There are some factors that you can't do anything about, but there are some you can do something about, like eating healthy, uh, maintaining a healthy weight, um, being careful about your, um, your medication that you take, like uh, hormone replacements and contraceptives. See a gynecologist before before you start some of those medications so that you can be um, counseled and helped, okay? So there are those general risk factors that you can do something about, but when it comes to the genetics that you can't, what can you do? And that's where screening comes in, okay? Because they, they, there are some factors that you can't change, so the best you can do is do screening so that in case you develop the disease, it is caught early and treated, okay? And you know, um, some people say, what I don't know <laughs> doesn't hurt me, okay? <laughs> uh, but when it comes to cancer, that's not true. Because what you don't know actually will kill you. 
um, some people say, ah, ah, let me first enjoy my life. And then I will find out when, you know, I can't, uh -huh. <laughs> And unfortunately, that comes from the belief that there is not, that once you find out you have cancer, you're going to die. You know, so they are like, ah, let me postpone, okay? But it is so important that you catch it in the early stages because it, it is treatable yes. and there is hope for survival. There is hope for cure when it's caught early. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the treatment is not as bad in the earlier stages, okay? So the treatment of cancer, I know you will talk about it, but the treatment of cancer changes according to the stage, Okay, in the earlier stages, we use less things, less modes, methods of treatment mm. that are not as harsh. Okay, and even when we have to do, let's say, surgery, it may not be as extensive or as um, as as difficult when it's an earlier stage. Mm. So generally, the outcomes are better. Mm. So I would I would really encourage everyone to do screening. Mm. And as we said, even, even, even women who have no risk factors, mm -hmm. okay, still develop breast cancer, mm -hmm. okay? So that means that um, the best way for prevention is screening. Mm -hmm. right. so tell us more about the treatment in the same breath. <laughs> I had mentioned a little bit about the treatment. And when we come to treatment of breast cancer, you may look at it as treatment of uh, the disease and then treatment of the patient as a whole, okay? So when we are looking at treatment of the disease, there are four main treatments. One is surgery. Um, we may do an operation either to remove the part of the breast that has the disease or to remove the whole breast, okay? Then we may do uh, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy are drugs that kill the cancer cells. Most commonly they are given in the vein, intravenously, but they can also be given orally. Um, usually after that we have radiotherapy, which is like a type of special x-rays that uh, kill cancer cells as well. And uh, finally, also hormonal treatment. So for breast cancer, there are different types. There are some types of breast cancer that are sensitive to hormones, and there are some types that are not. So depending on the type of breast cancer you have, we give some medication that um, uh, manages your hormone levels so that the, the cancer doesn't grow. And those are the main ways in which we treat the cancer itself. But of course, as Gertrude has said, you have to look at the patient as a whole. So we also add nutritional advice and therapy. We also add um, occupational therapy. We also ha add, um, you know, psychological help, ment you know, management of your emotions and things like that. And then, as I said, that many times now we find that we're diagnosing breast cancer in younger and younger ladies who want to have children. So we also add that reproductive counseling as well. So when you're diagnosed with breast cancer, there are, and you're going through the treatment, there are certain ways in which we can preserve your fertility so that you're able to have children when you've finished your treatment. So we talk through the options and uh, we help them, the, our patients to have treatment in such a way that um, even after that, they will be able to achieve their dreams, they'll be able to do what they want with their lives. So we, we think about all those and all that comprises the treatment of breast cancer. Yes. That is powerful, the, the, the 360 support. Huh? All right, back to Gertrude. <laughs> Gertrude, what message do you have for someone out there who has breast cancer? and is listening to you right now? Um, the first message I have, if you have breast cancer diagnosis, you need to see the right, the right professionals. There are a lot of uh, doctors in white coats. Some are veterinary doctors, some are herbalists. And as a patient, normally we don't know who mm. to go to. And uh, many times I've seen patients missed 
and by the time they come for us for counseling, you also feel sad. So, but because they've not stuck, we know centers in Kampala that treat cancer. We know if I'm not in Zambia, then I'm in Uganda Cancer Institute. Mm. But you find the patients in many other places that you don't not heard about that they treat cancer, mm. but uh, patients are there. I think I really want to advise them that they need to see the, the experts into mm. cancer, but also adhere to treatment. Some people see a professional, but they are diverted. First take this or add this together to this. And they, I always want them to consult the experts in case they want to change or to add something on their treatment. But also to give them hope that cancer is treatable, cancer is curable, especially breast cancer, and you can achieve as much dreams as you can. But also I have a message for employers. We have a lot of women who have lost their employment because some employers think once you have cancer, you're gone. So that adds to the stigma. So, and that's, I've seen some corporate women have st are stuck with their lamps because they fear to disclose to their bosses or to be off their jobs. But I want to encourage them that the earlier as doctor mentioned, they go out the better and the results will be good. When you have early cancer, you have less, uh, less strong treatment. Although all of it is uh, strong, but at least it's not as harsh as when your cancer is all over the body. And of course, to do the screening, those who have not had their, the opportunity to do the screening, especially this month. No woman should miss having her breast checked. That's a very good message. No woman should miss having their breast checked. Just um, throw more light on this thing of stigma. You know, I know you've talked about employers, we, we talked about counseling family, um, but what should someone, for example, the viewers who are watching, to, to help fight the stigma at, at an individual level? You know, what should the mindset be? Um, and any other thing that uh, your organization could be doing about the issue of stigma? Um, stigma is still a big challenge, very big. As I mentioned at our organization, we, we see about a thousand people every year. We cancel them, they survive, and there are so many survivors out there. But I think when you see every October, it's the same stories in the papers. There are, there are many who cannot share their testimony. There are many who cannot sit here and say, I survived the cancer. And it's because of stigma. One of them is a set of induced stigma. You think people will, I don't know what they think, but some people don't even talk about it. Mm. And they, they, because they fear others to know. I've seen women who have, even their children, even their closest relatives are not aware. And that, that tortures the entire family. But they say, no, I won't tell my children. So that is stigma. But also there is that stigma out there in the community that they think cancer is contagious. So probably if I touch her clothes, I'm going to get cancer. If she came and sat next to me, so they, they, they distance themselves away from the patient. Mm -hmm. And when the patient realizes that people are distancing from me, they would not talk about it. We have a member who was a teacher, and when she went back to school, everybody didn't want to sit next to her in the staff room. Mm -hmm. They didn't even want to touch the cup. So she almost left her job. So I think because they, I, I think they thought cancer is contagious, mm -hmm. but I think it's the information that cancer, you don't get it because I've sat next or I've cared for a patient. Mm -hmm. So I think we need, as an organization, we, we encourage our survivors to share their stories as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm happy this October we've had the several stories running in Monitor. Monitor writes a story every day. Mm -hmm. New vision, at least many are coming out to, to write, mm -hmm. to share. And when they share that, we are killing stigma. So it's not me mm. that is coming out. Some people tend to think I'm not a survivor, but I'm just encouraging people mm. because they see me more often all the time they see me. But if there are many more people coming out, mm. then they, we shall end the stigma. Mm. Yes. Wow, thank you. I'm, I'm enjoying the show, but um, <laughs> I think we've, we're coming to the end. Um, there is still much more that uh, doctor can share and uh, Miss Gertrude, and we can link you to them. Um, I'm sure you can also come to Nsambia. 
and uh, Gertrude will be giving her number. So, Doctor, do you have any final comments? Um, basically, to encourage everybody, uh, men and fem uh, males and females, to check their breasts, okay? And uh, especially also for the men, you know, we don't talk about, we always say ladies, ladies, ladies. And unfortunately, many of the times, the men come in when the disease is so advanced, simply because they never thought that, they, that men also get breast cancer. So for ladies and gents to check their breasts and to make sure that they are... Um, that they they see their doctors and have breast cancer screening done uh, regularly. Um, also for survivors, we always encourage them to speak up. And just like Gertrude has said, that, that is the stigma buster. If we speak up, if we say what we've been through, um, so many times, so many of our patients, they don't want to tell their employers, they don't want to tell their families, because people will start making a will for you and grabbing the property and, you know, they'll say, oh, that person is uh, walking dead. So, you know, it's so important that all of us band together to fight this disease. And when we diagnose early, we treat early, it will become a thing of the past. So yes, we continue to spread our messages and our awareness um, and hope that you're listening. <laughs> Indeed, they are listening because uh, we are screening live on social media. So some questions have come up, actually, as you are giving your remarks, so some. And one of them is, uh, what causes cancer of the oesophagus? <laughs> and the other is, um, what particular foods should be avoided? Um, I think the third is on screening, and you answered it already. So the cancer and foods. Okay, so mm. the oesophagus is the throat. Okay, yeah. and um, it connects the mouth to the to the stomach. Okay, and there's um, different risk factors um, from infections, uh, infections with certain viruses, um, to diet. Okay, so um, very spicy food, uh, very hot food. Um, can put you at risk for cancer of the esophagus. But probably the biggest risk factor is smoking. Uh, so if someone has been smoking for a long time, um, that also puts them at, cancer of, uh, at risk for, the, for that cancer. And uh, reflux. So what people call, when you get um, acid reflux, so heartburn for a long period of time, Okay, it shouldn't just be ignored. When you have it, it should be managed because if prolonged exposure, when acid keeps moving from your stomach to your throat, then it um, sort of erodes the, the throat lining and can put someone at risk for cancer of those figures. So, so some of those are the risk factors. I would say because this question clearly shows that people are thinking about risk factors for all cancers. Mm -hmm. And many of them are in interconnected, okay? Smoking, alcohol, um, an unhealthy diet, and a few of those ignoring illnesses. So you're sick, but you're, you're, you just put it off. You're like, ah, may I have ulcers? That's how I am. And you never address it and yet you don't know that in the long run it's putting you at risk for s stomach cancer or esophageal cancer so some of those risk factors um, are the, you know the common thread in most of these cancers yeah when you have awareness sessions because i can imagine um, this is just one of the questions they are quite a number i'm sure people are wondering yet we can't go on and on um, so do you have days scheduled um, here at the hospital, maybe once a month, I don't know, when you have talks and people can come or can follow you um, on social media? So usually we have, uh, we assign a specific cancer for each month that we uh, dedicate our awareness messages to. We do send um, messages, uh, phone messages. We do um, 
have posts on our social media, on our Facebook uh, channel, on YouTube, uh, on uh, Twitter, in Sambia Hospital. So we always uh, try to share about the causes of cancers, how you can prevent it, how you can detect it, how do you screen, how do you treat, and we have those posts up. So you can check uh, social media and see um, for some of the cancers. Um, we also do awareness talks. And before COVID, it was a bit more frequent and more regular. We'll go to different uh, workplaces and talk about this. Different, uh, really, organizations uh, and talk about cancer and spread awareness. Um, also at our facility itself, we usually have different colored ribbons. So this month it's pink for breast cancer, but throughout the, the year in the different months, we have different colors, blue for colorectal and prostate cancer and all that. So that also kind of sparks some awareness. Um, if anyone would like more information about any uh, of these cancers, we are available Monday to Friday at uh, the Cancer Institute in Zambia. To give you more information, we have brochures on different types of cancer, and we also have screening um, packages. So discounted screening packages for whether you want to screen for, let's say, ladies for the cancers, or generally do a screen for your whole body for different types of cancers. So we have all these um, are available and yeah, you're welcome to our cancer center and you'll get all the help that you need. Yes. Thanks. That is good. Um, there was a question on food, on the foods that we should eat and another related one is saying, is it true a cancer, a cancer patient, okay. Um, a cancer patient is not supposed to take sugar, milk, yogurt, eggs, and meat. But the first question was on uh, preventive. It was kind of preventive. Uh, what particular foods should we avoid? Yeah, so both questions are on diet. We advise whole, whole foods or organic foods, not processed foods. So generally, if you're eating something that is growing out of the ground, you're on the right track. So if you're, of course, you can't be 100% all the time, but for the most part, if you have lots of fruit, lots of vegetables, lots of natural um, foods in your diet, then you're on the right path. Because it's processed foods that usually bring uh, the challenges, especially processed meats, um, have been linked with certain types of cancer like colon cancer. So if we avoid that, then we are on the right track. Of course, uh, with sugar, high intake of sugar, high intake of salt has also been linked to certain cancers. So we generally encourage our patients to moderate the amount of sugar they are taking in, to moderate the salt, and um, yes, to take generally whole foods, lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, yes. Okay. <laughs> there we are. I think we've, we've listened. <laughs> so Gertrude, any final words? Um, I want to thank Sentinel and Nsambia for the opportunity to bring Wakaso on board and to recognize us as a, an equal partner in the fight against cancer. And I want to encourage everybody there that you can do something. I think it's not only Sentinel or Zambia or doctors, but each one of us has a role to play. At your level, if, if she talked about the eating the food naturally, maybe a housewife and then maybe making a good meal, a healthy meal for the family, that's a big contribution in, in, in the prevention. And you can donate if you are not, not able to do anything. You can donate to our cause. Even 1,000 shillings, we take it because we know we have some people who are struggling. We have people who need breasts. We've been struggling to bring in those breasts uh, to, so that women can get them free. And, but we can't. But people are there. Maybe they have some resources. And they, you can donate to Nsambio, to Sentinel, to whatever, or to Ukaso. But I, I just encourage everybody to do something about cancer at your level. That's my final message.
<laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you, viewers. I'll also thank you. Um, Gertrude, I know, like you said, not everyone can share their story. And not everyone will share it as naturally as you've done it. <laughs> but thank you very much. Um, just continue with the awareness, with the support. Um, I'm sure more people support your organization. Yeah, may, may the Lord continue strengthening you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lewis, we are very grateful having you. Sincerely, you're being here, there are people in a queue waiting there. <laughs> but at least there are some who are being saved right now, not to come to the queue. <laughs> so thank you for your knowledge that you've shared very freely. I believe we'll need more, so we'll come back. I'm, um, I'm encouraged about the monthly cancers, so I think we'll, we'll find a way to connect with you. I'm sure the viewers w as well. Yeah. So thank you very much, viewers. We still have some days um, in the cancer month, ca breast cancer month. And uh, as Gertrude told you, let the month not go without your testing. Go to your doctor. Go to the nearest, even the nearest um, clinic. And uh, even if October passes by, you can still go and test for breast cancer. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, We'll meet again. We'll continue on this awareness drive. Have a blessed day. Thank you.